All right, we are recording. It is 4 p.m. sharp. And so we are going to go ahead and get started. We are live and in person in the InvoClab 2026 in the CSTV. Thank you to all who came in person and to everyone who's online. Um, it is my privilege and pleasure to announce um, our speaker for today, Seth Champagne. Seth graduated from Southeastern. He's one of our alumni, graduated in 2017. He had a double major in computer science and mathematics. And he's been working for the U.S. Naval Research Lab for several years, since 2015, so quite a while. Um, he specializes in geospatial information systems, GIS, and he's currently completing a master's at Southeastern. He's back on campus um, for his ISAT. He has a concentration in data science, and he enjoys long distance running, watching anime, and he has a cat named Graham. So without any more ado, here is Seth. Champagne, thank you, Seth, for joining us. Champagne, thank you, Seth, for joining us. Security slides. Can you have a clicker? Or just... Okay. Can you share the screen? See. So the not Okay. Yeah, All right, we'll just have to go with five and six level. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, Dr. Ashi already kind of went through my intro, but I'll run through it a little bit again. I'm Seth Champagne. I graduated 2017, computer science and math. Um, I'm currently a master's student here at Southeastern. I work for the Naval Research Lab at Stennis Space Center. If anybody doesn't know where Stennis Space Center is, it's right on the border of Louisiana and Mississippi, right after the first exit. Um, and we work for the Center for Geospatial Sciences. We specialize in uh, geospatial information systems for the Navy. Um, I'll go through a little bit on background. Uh, the Naval Research Lab does research and development projects for the Department of the Navy and the uh, intelligence community. So our largest sources of funding are the Office of the Naval Research Lab and are the Office of Naval Research and the National Geospatial Intel Intelligence Agency. Um, and one of our biggest projects is on implementing these open web map uh, specifications. So we serve up map data, feature data, and this includes like satellite imagery, ocean bathymetry, nautical charts, and I have a, a couple of screenshots of that in a second. And then we also developed a side-by-side uh, -side desktop map client where they can pull up two different versions and two different versions of charts and compare and contrast them, uh, do like auditing to see what changed in them. Um, this is what they look like, they kind of small. So hard to see, but uh, up here we have the nautical charts. There's a lot of like wrecks, uh, ocean depths, uh, buoys, and these are what are actually used by the aircraft carriers, battleships, uh, submarines to navigate the oceans. Uh, so the naval, the NGA has to maintain these. They have a requirement for safety of navigation. They have to make sure that these charts are up to date, where they're not going to run aground when they're uh, navigating. So we make software that helps NGA make sure that these charts are correct. Um, below that is the aeronautical charts. Uh, it's for airplanes, it's another big project of ours. I don't uh, work on it personally. And then I just have a little screenshot of New Orleans. This is a satellite imagery from one uh, 
This is a satellite imagery from one of our services. And uh, beneath that is the OpenStreetMap version where we serve up our own custom version of OpenStreetMap. Um, and one time I was just kind of wondering like what, who exactly uses these things? Uh, like why are we trying to create our own OpenStreetMap when um, you, know, you can go to openstreetmap.org and use it? And I asked my coworker and he responded with, the guys that use this app do bad things to bad people. And after he said that, I didn't want to ask any more questions. So on to project that I'm more involved in, MeTalk Server. I'm actually the principal investigator for this project. Um, that's like the technical lead for the project. And MeTalk is meteorology and oceanography data. So like air temperature, wind speeds, uh, ocean currents, waves, salinity. And we create a bunch of lightweight RESTful services to serve up this data. Uh, it's terabytes and terabytes worth of data. They create forecasts um, for every three hours all over the world. Um, and this data is really important for a number of different uses. So down at the bottom, I can read all some of these acronyms. It's safety and navigation, underwater, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, anti-submarine warfare, acoustic uh, path availability, uh, automatic to automatic target recognition this is a, and these are just a handful of examples that I can go over but um, this data is really important to know what the environment's going to be like so that they can uh, properly plan their mission so it, a TDA is a tactical decision aid and um, we're delivering this data to TDAs and then I'm gonna wrap this up real quick uh, over here, we have an example of air temperature data, and then next to that is sea temperature data. Um, like I said, they produce forecasts for this every three hours. And this is a lot more um, fine-tuned than like your commercial, your commercial like windy.com data. This stuff goes really, really in depth on the environment. Sometimes it uses classified uh, observations to produce these models. And they call it grid data because they produce a, they produce a forecast at every like 20 uh, 0.25 latitude every 0.25 longitude it creates this big matrix worth of data and it is a forecast for the average of that variable in that area um, but it's still high resolution enough to give you an idea of what your conditions are going to be when you're planning your mission and then this one's a little bit cooler this is uh, wave watch three so this is predicting the significant wave height over time. They produce a two week forecast and you can get an image at each, at each two weeks. And I produce this animation from the VTOC server. And you can see there's like a storm that's moving through the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, and the, the two agencies that produce this data, Finmoc and NAVO, one of them's in Monterey, California. I've been to Monterey, California before. It's really nice, uh, highly recommended. Uh, the other one is NAVO. NAVO is based out of Stennis Space Center. Um, Dr. McDowell's wife, Pam McDowell, used to work there. Uh, it's really funny. I ran into her at the airport a couple times. Um, she's really nice. But anyway, those Navy agencies, they're really, they're really focused on producing the data, and they don't have the software expertise to actually get the data to the users. And that's where we come in. We're, we're a bit of like middleware, but we're really kind of connecting the dots between the centers that are creating all this data and the end users that need this data. Sometimes the end users are disconnected and uh, especially like the drones, they have very little uh, Wi-Fi connectivity, just a small window of time to actually get the data that they need uh, when they need it. So we're bridging that gap. But that's enough about my background and what I work on. I wanna move on to the actual topic uh, that I picked for this conversation, for the, this talk, and that's expectations. More, more specifically, I want to talk about career expectations. Um, I know that I call this talk careers in computer science research, but really it's more research in computer science careers because um, I felt like I wanted to get up here and rant about my job, um, but I felt like pictured here, me, the cranky old man, I didn't want to be the only cranky old man. So I, I reached out to my friends and in, in my professional network and got a lot of uh, responses for how they feel about their careers. Specifically, I asked these three questions. What were your career expectations when you started college? 
what were they when you graduated college, and how are they now? Um, I really wanted to focus on how did your expectations change as you got further into your career, because I felt like my expectations changed a lot, and I wanted to see, like, can, do other people feel the same way? So I asked about 25 different people. Uh, each of them had between five and up to 20 years of ex uh, 20 years or more of experience. I estimated about over 200 uh, combined years of experience. And if we average about four jobs each throughout our career, then we've held over 100 different unique jobs. Um, so I think these are all really cool people. I think they gave me really great answers. I keep the answers, um, keep the answers anonymous. But uh, I hope that, I hope that getting insight from people that have been in the career for a little while will give you um, kind of an idea of what to expect when you start when you start your career, what kind of career you really want to look for. So we'll start with where I started. Um, like a lot of people, I was interested in programming because I liked video games. Um, way back when I was a kid in the 90s, I played Pokemon and I had a, a blast. I really wanted to like not just play video, not just play video games, but make video games. But you know, things have changed a lot since these video games. Um, I was expecting to make video games like this, but you know, nowadays you kids grew up with Pokemon looking like this. And you know, like we've come a long way. I know this isn't the flashy video game on the market right now, but it is a lot different than what it was in the 90s. And here we got this great gif of Snorlax destroying Oshawa. Um, but my expectations were to make games like they were when I was a kid, and now it's a whole lot different. And it kind of segues into this first quote, where I didn't really know what to expect in school. I started interest in game development because I realized a few things. Um, I didn't like I didn't like graphic design, and the gaming industry sucks for developers. I don't know if you've heard much about working in the game industry. It's often uh, a lot of hours, low pay, and then sometimes you get laid off at the end of the when the video game comes out. Um, but this was from a coworker of mine. I didn't realize that he was into video games because he was a good bit older than I, than I am. But uh, he said that he was good at computer science when he started school and he stuck with it. And I think this is a very relatable take because that's kind of how I felt too. Like once I started programming, I enjoyed it. Um, we, have these, we have these ideas growing up on what we want to do and you don't know what it's going to be like until you actually get there. Uh, video games look like this now, they might be fully virtual reality in the future. We don't really know. So kind of starting off from expectations coming out of college, a lot of people talked about they really liked the opportunities that they were given. Um, so reading, reading a little bit from here, uh, computer science was foreign to me, but now now I see what I can improve on, what I know I can do, what's out there. And because CS is such a broad field, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. I'm sure you all know, like, every corporation needs software. And when you're working in tech, you can work for almost any corporation that there is in some degree or capacity. Uh, so, like, I do geospatial information systems. I know nothing, I knew nothing about meteorology or like navigating the oceans or anything like that when I started my job, but I picked up that knowledge along the way. So I'm writing software, but I'm also learning these other fields that go along with it. Um, and this is a different quote. I wanted to work in a high demand field that was both challenging and compensated well. I also knew the ability to find a job regardless of where I lived and or find a new job easily if my current job was not working out well. This is a big, this is a big key point, uh, not just feeling like you're stuck in one job, but knowing that you can move to another job if you need to. If you really don't like your career, you can change careers. Um, and that kind of leads to uh, well, another big topic coming out of college is this imposter syndrome where uh, I like, I like to think of it as the inferiority complex where you think everyone is better than you. Uh, you're fresh in your career. You don't know uh, how to do everything. Sometimes you feel like you don't belong. Um, but I've, I got a lot of answers that were like this where uh, thought the work would be hellish hard work. 
but then I started to realize that uh, everyone was just around the same about same skill level as I was. They just had more experience than I did. Once uh, he says, now my expectations, I can do anything I want because eventually I'll figure it out. And this is just something that you gain over time. You realize that if you don't know something, but someone else does know something, they've just worked on it and you haven't. Um, when you put in when you put in enough time, you can learn everything that your coworkers know, whatever everything that your coworkers will know. So you may feel early on in your career that you don't really know everything, or you don't know how to do this. You're not. You don't think you'll ever be job or just the project manager job. But once you really see the job in action and work, you realize that you are qualified for those jobs. And um, it goes back to those opportunities. These, uh, there's a, a wide range of jobs that you can do. You don't want to box yourself in and you don't want to discourage yourself. You want to just put in your work because uh, it'll get better over time. A uh, big thing is the work environment. You know, if you're around people that support you, if you're around a company that cares about you, then especially if you have a mentor, uh, this is one thing I tell people that coming out of college, if you don't have someone that's your mentor, then you're really going to struggle to get better at your job. Uh, your job should ideally give you someone that can answer your questions, can help you um, learn what you need to learn in order to succeed in that job. If they're not trying to help you succeed in their job, then they're not, uh, they're not even serving their own best interests because they hired you to get the job done. So they want to set you up for success. And then this, this one, job hopping, it's not really my experience, but it is common. Um, I do have more than a few friends that, you know, they leave, they work a job for a while and then they leave to go get another job. And the benefit to this is, you know, you can quickly increase your pay. You can uh, work on a variety of different projects, a variety of different technologies, and you can try and like speed up your career development this way. Um, you know, like this, like this one says, uh, if I leave my job every six months, maybe I'll make 50% more than my peers. And that can be true, but you're also changing your, your you're also changing what you're doing every six months. Um, you may be moving to a new location every six months. You may be starting from square one on new technologies. Um, you have to meet new, you have to meet new coworkers and build those relationships again. Um, so there's the upside that you can have employers bidding on your services. You can jump to this job, get a little bit more money, jump to this job, get a little bit more money. But the downside is you have to constantly change your focus on what you're working on. So uh, reading just a little bit more, feels like I've been alternating dra between drastic company changes and mismanagement to projects that I could not see myself being useful on long term, uh, but it kind of unintentionally helped out and accelerated my career growth being exposed to many different perspectives and technologies. It's also very nice to really have project, not really have project burnout, something I personally would be a problem with. So I don't fully endorse job hopping, but I can't fault you for doing it. It works out for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people are very successful with it and companies will try and poach employees from other, from other companies. But this is kind of, it kind of takes a real, different personality type to be okay with always meeting new people, always working on new projects, um, and possibly not having that job stability. You might have to move into a different career and learn new technologies. Um, this quote here I wanted to highlight uh, right after, because this quote didn't come from someone in computer science. This came from uh, one of my friends that was a business major, and uh, he kind of had a similar experience to what I've seen in computer science, where coming out of college, you might uh, you might have the total opposite opinion of the inferiority complex. Some people come out of college and they feel like they can do everything. Uh, they're smart. They should be running the project. They should be running the show. Uh, they want to quickly uh, move up to higher level positions, and you know, job job hopping is one of those ways that you can do that, but you're not always going to have your dream job and salary straight out of college. It takes time. 
it takes work experience to get those promotions. Um, you may want to be the project lead, you may want to be the manager, but you need to have management skills. And if you think that like working a project courses at Southeastern is enough to get you the project manager skills for a real job, you come in on the first day demanding that, they, they're going to look at you like this. They're going to say, oh, who's this, who's this little kid that thinks that he can run everything? He doesn't even know what we work on. Um, so you really need to have that humble perspective. Don't think that you're going to get it all right away. Don't think that you're going to get to be the one to call all the shots. You may think that what you're being told to work on is stupid because you don't fully understand why it's useful. Um, like I still work in Java 8. And I would think, oh, we need to update this newest version of Java. Well, there's technical reasons why we can't. There's legal reasons why we can't. So we have to deal with the challenges that are put in front of us. And it won't always be the newest, flashiest thing. Um, you won't always get to implement something exactly how you want it to be done. But um, you're not, you're not going to be the boss on your first day in, out of college. And so here I'm going to step like away from the quotes for a second, because this one is more my perspective um, with the fear of missing out, or like what I call it, being underpaid and agitated. So a few years ago, uh, I was in a meeting with my boss and my team lead, and it was the individual development plan meeting, where they were meeting with me to figure out, okay, what are you going to work on? How are you going to improve? How are you going to improve your skills so that you can grow in your career? And I didn't want to hear any of it. I just threw this tantrum in front of my boss saying I was overpaid. I mean, I was underpaid and I was overworked and stressed out. And I had got a job offer from some other, from some other company for 25% more and I was ready to leave. And I didn't feel like my job was setting me up for what the success I felt like I deserved. Like I saw people making more money than I did with less skills. I saw people coming out of college making more money than I was. And I, I feel a bit over this. Um, and really looking back, I kind of feel like it was childish of me. And my boss assured me, he was like, look, we're gonna get you, uh, if you stick with us, we're gonna get you uh, working more on more important projects. We can get you raises every year. Uh, don't look on the short term, look on the long term. And this, this line down here is something I wish someone had told me coming out of college, you don't have to min-max your earning potential. Life is not about how much money you make. It's not a competition. It's not Pokemon or Dark Souls. It's not a video game. If you want to focus so much on the amount of money you make at the expense of like how you live in your life, um, what you're doing in your personal time, you're going to be a very miserable person. And that's what I was a few years ago. I was a miserable person because I was just thinking about how much more money I could be making rather than what I was working on right then and there. And I wanted to illustrate FOMO using a topic that some of you might be familiar with, Bitcoin. So I was worried about a 25% raise that was maybe $15,000, $20,000 per year. That's, that's not insignificant money. But when I was in high school, Bitcoin was $10 a coin. And I knew about Bitcoin. I could have bought Bitcoin. I had a few thousand dollars. I had enough where I could have been one of these Bitcoin millionaires. And I could already see it going up. It's like I should, I should have seen the trend. It had 10 times, 10 times itself in one year. I never bought it. I've never bought Bitcoin. Um, and then now you see when I graduated college, it was 10,000 and then it hit 20,000 in the first big spike. And then last year it peaked at $68,000. And the point I'm trying to make is like, I can cry over the 15, $20,000 I didn't make. There were other ways I could have made money, and I didn't even have to go to school for Bitcoin. I could have just bought Bitcoin. Um, and this is like a this is like a silly example, but this is kind of like how we think when we're when we're just thinking about money. We're thinking about, oh, I should have done this. Oh, I should have done that. Um, I'm not making enough money. I deserve this, or um, and then you end up miserable because you missed out on things, uh, and you think that money was money is going to fix all your problems. Uh, the re in reality, if I had bought Bitcoin. Uh, I would have sold out way before it hit the maximum. I have one friend, he told me he bought Bitcoin in around 2010, 2011, and he spent seven Bitcoin on a pizza. And if you run the map on that, that's about uh, $200,000, $300,000 pizza. So 
Oh, yeah. All quotes and anecdotes are anonymous. <laughs> but but anyway, it's like it's like don't cry over spilled milk. Um, my boss was right in the end because in three years since I threw that tantrum, I've gotten enough raises where I got that twenty five percent. I didn't have to leave my job, and I'm making just as much money if I had left then. So my long term earning potentials, it's not really it's not really that much money I, I missed out on. But in the meantime, like now I'm. A tech lead on a project that I really enjoy, a project that is projected for millions of dollars of growth into the future. So they've really set me up for success by just sticking out with uh, the job that I'm already in. Um, but speaking of uh, sticking to a job, you can also kind of change jobs. Um, I have a lot of friends that didn't start out in computer science. They were, you know, this one's a I, this one was a biology major. He graduated. He said a few years later, he said, uh, nobody really wants undergrad biology majors. And he came back to school for computer science so that he wouldn't feel replaceable. This other friend here, uh, he actually got a PhD in the humanities, but then started working for a company that needed a data scientist. So he learned Python on the side, and now he does data, now he does data engineering for this uh, software company. And he doesn't even have a computer science degree. But, you know, these are, this is to kind of illustrate that um, if you don't like your current career, you can always move to a different career. Uh, you don't have to feel like, oh, I studied this, so I have to do this. Um, that's also going to make you unhappy. If you don't like your job, you have the time and, and skills to move to other jobs. Uh, even when you're 30, 40 years old, you can still learn things, you can still change careers. And even then, there's different career options within computer science. I like these because they were conflicting opinions. Honestly, I never intended to be a developer when I started college. I just thought I'd be a system administrator. And when I graduated, I got a full-time dev job. Now I'm expecting to be a senior role in an engineering manager. On the flip side, I stopped working as a developer. I, like he always thought that he would be a developer. And then he became a, when he became a system administrator. But now he loves being a system administrator. He loves solving real problems, getting to be a big kid at the table, making decisions. And these are like flip flops of each other. Um, you, you would be surprised how many different jobs with a computer science degree you are qualified to do. Um, and you don't want to you don't want to discount any any job thinking that you won't enjoy it, especially if you don't enjoy the job you have right now. There are other, other tangentially related jobs you can look at that you might really enjoy. So not even drastically changing career from being a biologist to being a computer scientist. Um, like maybe just pick up some extra skills in system administration and you might find a, a new career that you really love. Um, a lot of people kind of discount the opportunities that they have. Like recently I learned how to do pivot tables in like spreadsheets in Excel. And I feel like I could go get a job as an accountant. So if you ever see me, I uh, don't like programming anymore. I might be working as an accountant. And if that makes me happy, I'm going to do it. So don't, don't ever discount the fact that a different job could make you happier than your current job if you're unhappy. But speed flipping again, the majority of my answers uh, to the survey, or the majority of the answers that I got from the survey were about stability and benefits and really about finding a job where you can stick to it long term. Because when you get older, you start to feel like, oh, I don't want to be doing something brand new every year. I want to know what I'm doing so that I, well, I know what I, I want to know what I'm working on next year so that I can plan ahead for next year. I can plan around all the other things that happen in my life. Let's see, now that I'm older, further along in my career, there are several expectations I have. The first is stability. Knowing that, I'm not in a, knowing that I'm in a job that I love, surrounded by a great cast of people. Nowadays, my expectations are that I have a job I love and can have a good work-life balance. I want to enjoy things uh, with coworkers that I enjoy and languages that I enjoy. I still generally expect the same thing from my career, stability, good work-life balance, good salary. I feel like I've learned so much through the industry experience and that there's always interesting new problems to solve and knowledge gaps to fill, as long as you're willing to keep learning. So, um, every single year that I've worked at NRL, even though it's been the same job, I've worked on something completely different. Um, 
it even it might even be the same project, but I've still learned new technologies and I need to meet the task at hand. So there's that stability where I'm on the same project. I know what I know what to expect, but I still have new challenges that I can that I can take on. Um, and then like there's new challenges outside of my life that I have to take on. Like I recently got married. I'm looking at buying a house. Um, these are things that having a stable career makes you confident that you can do. And then a, a few more quotes here. Right now, the big thing for me is work-life balance and benefits. Since getting married, salary sucker. Um, but having having unlimited PTO and being able to step away to handle on handle personal and family matters is something that you can you can't really put a salary on. So pay time off very important. If you want to be a millionaire, uh, if you want to maximize your earning potential, you could work 80 to 100 hours a week. You could go find your own company and work nonstop, always be on call. And that might, that might motivate you. You might be happy by that. But there are other things in your life that are separate from your career. Um, you don't, I don't really recommend that you define yourself by your work or what you do. Um, because Work can be, work can really drag on sometimes. Sometimes it's really exciting, sometimes it's awful and you still have to do the awful work. And when you're doing awful work and you think everything is, everything about your life is just what you work on, then you feel awful from your job and that leads to some misery. But being able to take time off, spend time with your family. Um, you know, like I had a few, fun a few funerals I had to attend last year. Um, when I took off time for Thanksgiving, I got to go see all my extended family after not seeing them for over a year. Uh, these are like my most enjoyable time. My most enjoyable time is when I'm not working. So having a job that gives me uh, gives me that leeway to take off and, and handle the things that I need to is more important than money to me. Um, and then the best part that there's job security. The pay is really good and the benefits can be incredible. We're one of the few lucky fields enough to work uh, from home without issue. You find a great company to work for, everything is so worth it. Finding a company that doesn't treat you like a code monkey and values personal growth is better than a slightly higher salary. Um, really what, I really like this quote. Um, some companies just treat you like a figure on a spreadsheet. They don't care about you, but that really kind of almost takes away some of your humanity where you feel like you're not, you're not treated well you're stressed out, you know, uh, I was stressed out of my job, but I was stressing out over uh, things not related to my job. Um, but my job treats me well. And uh, one of these guys was talking to him about Hurricane Ida. I lost power for three straight weeks and my job said, okay, you're on a uh, paid administrative leave. So we're not gonna charge your vacation time. You don't have to, you don't have to do any work. We're gonna continue to pay you. And he said, uh, his job did something similar. They had a grant for hurricane relief. He was able to take a few weeks off of work, focus on all these other stresses related to the storm, but not have to worry about his job. His job took care of him. My job took care of me. You won't get that everywhere you go. But this is like key where uh, when you are having your hardest time, not having your job making it harder. Um, and having people that you having people that you work with that care about you, uh, so that you want to go work there. You don't you don't want to hate your coworkers to where you don't come in. Um, and you're more than just you're more than just your job. Uh, the work life balance thing it's a it's a bit of a buzzword. And when I was in college, I didn't really understand benefits. Like when they talk about salary and benefits, I understood salary, money is easy, but I didn't know benefits. I want to kind of run through some of the, some of the benefits that you should know about when you're talking about your benefits package. This isn't a completely exhaustive list, but first I want to point out the quote, I don't need to retire, I'll just be cryogenically frozen. This was, my coworker told me this whenever I was talking to him about retirement. Uh, he just said he was going to work until he couldn't anymore, they would freeze him. And when you could live forever, they would unfreeze and he'll go back to work. It's like, I want to retire. I don't know. I don't know about you. So number one thing, how much time you can take off for vacation, how much time you can take off when you get sick. Uh, 
at Interrail, we're paid hourly, but we earn our we earn our vacation time. Um, and I've heard some jobs that are salary they'll give you the unlimited vacation time, but unlimited vacation time is a little bit misleading because if you take two months off to go to the Bahamas, they might not want they might not want you when you come back. Um, but having a job that lets you take off time when you want. Uh, 401k matching. If you don't know about 401ks, uh, it's a tax incentivized retirement account. You contribute some of your money and then your employer will match it. And that is really important for building a nest egg so that you have money to live off of when it's time to retire. Uh, some jobs offer pensions, like the federal government offers pensions, but they're not as common anymore. You really need to get planning on retirement if you, if you want to ever retire. Take it seriously. Um, another thing to take seriously is health insurance. I don't know how many of you are younger than 26. You can still stay on your parents' plan. But when I turned 26, I had to buy my own health insurance for my employer, and I didn't think I needed it. And then the next year, I had over $2,000 in unplanned medical expenses. So life comes at you quick, and you need to, you need to be ready for it. Um, dental and vision plan, same thing. Life insurance is another thing that you can get you can get life insurance, uh, cheap plans for your employer. This is something that you don't think about until you have dependents, until you have a wife or kids um, or a husband, you know, anybody that depends on you. You want them to be okay if something happens to you. And that's what life insurance allows for you. I don't have any children, but I do have coworkers that have children. And having a place where they can, where you can drop them off uh, for affordable, uh, and know that they're safe is a big peace of mind while working. It's another thing to consider uh, as you get older. And then these, uh, COLA is cost of living adjustment, raises and promotions. This is something you really need to feel out with your coworkers and your boss. Like when I'm working this job, what are my, what are my perspectives for growing my salary? Uh, what jobs could I potentially promote into just kind of knowing if they have long-term plans to grow your career or if they're not going to offer those things and you need to look somewhere else. Um, so it's not always about the money that you make now. It's about the money that you can make in the future. Um, and cash bonuses and stock options. Cash bonuses, sometimes sometimes you get offered these. I've gotten a few cash bonuses as part of my yearly raise. Um, but stock options, stock options are a little bit tricky. Uh, this is like... Some big corporations will offer you stock options. A lot of startups will offer you stock options. And stock options, they don't always translate to the real dollar amount that you think they do. And what I mean is there's a vesting period. So they might give you $40,000 of stocks, but you can't sell those stocks until you've worked for them for four years. So if you work for them for three years and you absolutely hate your job and you want to leave, then you lose out on some of those stocks. You don't get that full amount that they promised you. Um, so stock options, they could be worth a whole lot of money or they could be misleading. And you need to do your research on those. And then other, other kind of intangible things, travel expenses, memberships, discounts. Um, these are just various things that you get depending on where you work. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I traveled to Monterey, California for a business trip to meet people out there, but it, it was kind of like a vacation almost. I've heard some people, they get to travel to Hawaii for, the, uh, for business travel. Some people, some people go overseas, they'll go to France and Japan for business travel. Sometimes it's more like business vacation than travel because they'll pay for your hotel, they pay for your food, all these things. These are kind of intangible benefits. Exactly. Hey, you went to Disney World. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm not the biggest fan on travel, but uh, some, some people really like to travel. I have some coworkers that travel a lot and they enjoy it. And the last thing I gotta say is education. I am in the ISAT master's program here and NRL is paying my tuition. NRL wants me to get a master's degree. They actually want me to get a PhD and they'd offer to pay tuition for me to get a PhD. I'm still, uh, still need some convincing on that. But besides just, ed besides just college, you might get the off, you might get the chance to earn certifications or other things that can build your skills. Um, and companies will pay you to get these, uh, get this further education. It's another benefit that you can consider. So last quote from the survey that I wanted to share, I want to work to make a difference. 
knowing that's something I was able to do in my job, helped at least one person better their job, gives me a sense of purpose and drive. Last would be passing knowledge on to the younger generation, not necessarily technical skills, but things to help them succeed. Uh, this was actually from my team lead, and there's been plenty of times where I thought I was smarter than him. I thought I knew better than him. Uh, we were working on a project, and I would say, oh, I meant to implement it this way. He says, no, you need to implement it that way. And then I go waste my time for a week trying to do it my way just to find out that I was wrong, he was right. I implemented his way, and it works the next day. Um, don't discount work experience, especially when someone's trying to help you. Um, they, you may think you may think you know how to do it, but if they've seen the problem before, then they definitely know how to do it because they've mel they've dealt with it before. Work experience isn't something you can get overnight. It's something that you get over time, and you just have to stick with it. Um, everybody will get there. This is kind of something that I wanted to say that everyone is going to think differently depending on their experiences. I talked about I felt childish and stupid uh, with a lot of the ways I acted coming out of college, but in hindsight, you're always going to feel like an idiot for this or that, um, but you're just missing some experiences that you're yet to have. So stick with it. Uh, don't get discouraged, and don't sell yourself just for a dollar. Um, really consider how you want to live your life. And that's all I had. So thank you. I can take questions. Uh, that's my work email and my stuff piece of email. And also NRL is hiring. If anybody's interested, let me know after the talk.